My name is Max Gagliardi, and you're listening to the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app, leave a review, help me out. This episode's guest is Dr. Scott Tinker. Dr. Tinker is the director for the Bureau of Economic Geology. He's also the state geologist for Texas, the chairman for the Switch Energy Alliance, and the professor holding the Edwin Alday Endowment Chair in the Jackson School of Geosciences for the University of Texas at Austin. I've been a huge fan of Dr. Tinker's work over the years, and I've always wanted to have him on the podcast. He's someone who has an incredibly powerful voice in the energy debate. And if this is your first time to hear him speak, then you're in for a treat. This episode, we discuss how we can have more productive conversations about energy and policy without falling into the trap of the hyperbolic rhetoric of the mainstream media. We dive into the geological history of the Earth's climate and the challenges involved with modern climate science. Lastly, we discuss energy poverty and how it's one of the biggest humanitarian crises that we face. And we explore realistic ways that we can lift humanity up and give people access to cheap and abundant energy. Hope you enjoy the show. Dr. Tinker, thanks for coming on Talk Energy. Glad to be here. Uh, you know, I was doing, I, first of all, my dad's a big fan. I grew up, uh, my dad's a geologist and has been in the industry, oil and gas industry for, you know, he's retired now, but uh, 35 plus years. I, uh, I've been in the industry for 11 years. And so, you know, recently he's always sending me stuff that you do, like articles and things. And then even historically before I, uh, he's been sending me stuff from a while back. He says, remember, I'd showed you uh, some of the stuff that, uh, Dr. Tinker has done. And so when I started the podcast, he immediately was like, you have to get him on. And so uh, it's probably, it's, I haven't been doing it for about a year, but I'm glad you were able to make it. I know that it'll be an episode he'll want to check out. Yeah. He must've been in trouble when he was sending you all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're in trouble. Read this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. No, I think it's just like the way you approach things. And I think there's been some more voices recently, uh, guys that have come out that are some of the talking points that you've been doing, I think for years. And so, uh, just in this age of where we're at with the oil and gas industry and the overall narrative, uh, just in general around climate and all these things, is some of the stuff I want to talk about. I think it's important uh, to have voices like yours. And so as I was researching for this, this is kind of the first topic. I don't know if you've seen this, but on YouTube, uh, there was like disclaimers at the bottom of some of the videos you had out there just talking about, you know, basic things. I think one of them, I got it copied and pasted here. It says like, uh, Climate change disclaimer says refers to the long term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns, mainly caused by human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels. YouTube just felt the note or the need to put that note at the bottom of one of the talks I think you did for UT about a year ago. How do we I mean, we're in this weird age where I feel, you know, I'm having these conversations with people about whether it be energy or whether it be climate. And it just feels like a strange time. I mean, what are your thoughts on that being <laughs> at the bottom of your videos? Yeah, I'd never seen it. <laughs> I don't. I didn't even know it was there. Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'd be curious who writes something like that if they have a deep energy background or if or not. <laughs> My guess right. is probably not. Um, the challenge on these things is, unlike unlike a lot of technical topics, um, for example, heart surgery. I don't really question my heart surgeon when they. I might get a second opinion, but I'm not going to probably tell them what I think or how they should do that surgery mm -hmm. at some point. And, but that's different in energy. Everybody has an opinion about energy and everybody thinks they're an expert. <laughs> so that's the world in which we live. And the reality is most people don't know how gasoline is made or you know, where electricity even comes from, but they think they do and they vote. So this is one of the great, this is one of the great dilemmas. And it's just something that we need to work through. But on the climate and energy piece, particularly, Max, it, you know, climate scientists are, it's a tough science, first of all, really complex, multivariate, nonlinear problem. It's a very, very difficult modeling problem. It takes a, And there's nobody that can do it all because so, it engages so many different facets of things. So it, it really requires teams of multidisciplinary teams, tough science. <clears throat> Most of them aren't energy people, you know, they but they talk a lot about energy because <laughs> right. when it gets into the solution space, you come into the energy world and then you have people opining on energy that aren't really equipped to do that any more than I'm probably equipped to opine heavily on climate modeling. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't do that work. I've done modeling in other things, but not in that area. So, you know, disclaimers. Yes. I think it's great to have a disclaimer. I think it's great. It would be great definitionally to remind people that, that when we say 
the planet is as warm as it's ever been. We're talking about since we had thermometers right. <laughs> measuring right. its heat, but it's actually one of the coolest periods in Earth history today, you know, and as geologists, we understand those things. And it's not that that's relevant for today's problem. It's not other than contextually. And I think that's the great, that's what matters is, is having some context and then putting this all in sort of contextual space. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I, you're already hitting on some things that I've got on the list here, stuff I want to talk about. But what's interesting to me is I feel like your approach that you take when you have these <clears throat> talks that you do or the articles that you've written, uh, to me, it seems very persuasive and effective. But what are some of the things that you've found works best when communicating these messages? Because I'll just tell you my quick personal experience is that it can be very polarizing. I've had people send me very nasty uh, emails or messages and things, and it can get very heated uh, when you're just having casual conversations with people. And so as somebody that's, I think, very polished around these narratives and, you know, talks to people and helps explain these things, what are some of the techniques or things that you've found work best uh, when trying to have this conversation? Yeah, it can be hard. You know, there's, <clears throat> it's very passionate to people and on all sides. You know? And so whenever you're dealing in this space of emotions and passion, it's not easy. I try, I call it the radical middle. I try to, try to yeah. bring, you know, thoughts in from, from the energy space, from the economy space and from the environmental space, because I'm passionate about all those. And most people are, <clears throat> you try to work and understand what the real fears are and what the real, um, data sets, you know, what's the space in which your context comes from. And, and, and I think if we can work towards those a little bit, you can have conversations that tend to mitigate the anger and really try to find civil dialogue. And it's okay not to agree on things as long as we're not picking data that don't exist or aren't real or were fabricated. But you know, in, in a real data world, there are different interpretations. We just recorded something at Switch called the Energy Switch. I'm really excited about it. It's a 10 episode PBS series. That's awesome. And I had, it was a talk show format. I, we built a beautiful studio and I sat between two people that we invited who are high level, internationally recognized, well-respected people. And we talked about 10 different topics. It was quite intense, two to three hours each. And then we're editing that down to 25 minute episodes. So one was on climate impacts and you know, we had Steve Kuhn in there, a pretty bright physicist who under Secretary of Energy under Mr. Obama first term and Michael Greenstone, a climate economist from the University of Chicago, they really had a, a deep dialogue. They didn't always agree on things and that's okay. I moderated and we talked about it and and we found points of agreement because most thoughtful people have those when you really get out of the out of the drama space. You can figure out what it is that's upsetting and and see if we can if we can work toward finding some compromise solutions in there. And I think that's certainly possible. Now, it's not with everybody. You know, there, there are going to be people that no matter what, they're going to be something angry about something. You know, just, right. And and so I'm not trying to pretend like it's solvable for everyone, but I think for most it really is. We all care. We all care about our land and our air and our water and our atmosphere. Big, the four big pillars in the environment. If we get too focused on one, if I just wanted to solve for water, for example, I might sacrifice the land or the atmosphere. If I just wanted to solve for the land or the soil, if I'm just solving for carbon, I might sacrifice the, lo the land and, and the water. Uh, so nothing is perfect environmentally when it comes to energy. They all have impacts. And I, I think this is very important for us to try to dialogue around and understand is, is that everything we do in energy <laughs> requires earth resources. So if we're drilling for oil and natural gas, there's a lot of environmental impact. You know, the drilling itself, the manufacturing of the, of the rigs, uh, moving it once it's produced and, and, and then refining it and burning it, these all have big impacts on our environment. And they're getting better. They're particularly getting better where in wealthy countries where there are regulations and and policies that are required to be followed by law. The challenge is when when big company X sells to international company Y, you know, it's not like 
the resources of big company X go away. They don't. Somebody buys those and begins to manage them. And if that company doesn't do as good of a job as the big company did, usually a U.S. company, it actually hurts the environment. So it's not a victory for the environment. <laughs> it, right. You know, these, these things change hands. Now, the reality also is the sun and the wind themselves are renewable, at least in the terms that we understand as humans and are, and are focused on. But the stuff to, col to capture the sun, the panels, or to capture the motion of the wind, the turbines, or to back them up, whether it's chemical batteries or other things, these, these aren't renewable. <laughs> these right. are mined resources, largely controlled and processed by China today globally. So there's an energy security piece, often done in ways that aren't done with the kinds of human rights that we expect in modern developed nations. And so there's a human rights component. And out comes this mined resource, the metals and the rare earth elements and other things that are needed to build solar panels, to make wind turbines and to make the batteries to back them up. So that's not renewable because they wear out and then we dump them in landfill or the oceans and then we make them again. So anytime you mine, manufacture and dump over and over, it's not a renewable process. And this is pretty tough for younger people, particularly who have been educated that there's good, clean, renewable energy and bad, dirty fossil energy or nuclear energy. When they begin to realize, and it doesn't take much, I mean, they don't disagree with the data or the facts it, that it's not renewable. Um, right. And depending on what you think about mining, I ask young people, do you think mining's green and nobody ever raises their hand? Yeah. And I said, how about big manufacturing, <clears throat> chemical manufacturing, like a battery manufacturing plant? Elon calls them gigafactories. <laughs> it's cool. Man. Yeah. Um, is that green? No, no. And how about when we dump all the batteries in the earth? No. So why do we think electric vehicles are green? And, and, and they look at me like I've tricked them somehow, <laughs> but, but I'm not tricking. I'm just, we're just asking sort of in a, in a Socratic approach, you know, just asking questions. Right. about these things and so i'm not against mining max it you know i'm a geologist if we don't grow it we mine it but everything we do to collect energy in its solid form in its liquid form in its gaseous form as heat or light or as motion from water or wind takes earth resources and it takes a lot of earth resources depending on how dense that form of energy is and the reality is uranium and thorium for nuclear are the densest and, and oil and is very dense as well. So is natural gas, CH4, methane and hydrogen, you know, or carbon and hyd hydrogen and methane, as opposed to the sun and the wind, which are not very dense. And so you have to have a lot of stuff. That's the trick, I think, is really getting people to converge on discussions that involve some data and and some of the science and the economics, the physics, so that we can address climate change for real. And we can also protect the rest of the environment while we also, you know, while we also lift the world out of poverty. Yeah. And that's another big topic. Our second film was about energy poverty globally. And, and so it's this dual challenge of, of energy for all and environmental protection, including climate, that dual challenge. And we got we gotta solve for both. So it's not simple, but it's solvable. And that's the, that's, I think the big trick here is to get folks to realize they need all the information and understand the social, legal, political systems surrounding all that so we can solve for it. If we think in black and white binary terms, we won't solve it. You know, it may feel good, it may feel good to send Max a note and say, hey, you're an idiot. You know, you don't believe in solar and wind, you're an idiot. Well, I yeah. do. It's not, it's not that I believe or not believe. That's kind of a religious term. But if I, look at the, if I look at the data surrounding these things and the economics and the physics, solar and wind have a role to play, but it's not the only role. And so we start to have conversations that are a little bit deeper. And I truly believe that the next generation of thinkers, and you're one of those, will solve these things if they get all the information. Well, I you had said a bunch of stuff and I liked all of it. Uh, the one thing at the beginning we were talking about that PBS show, if somebody who's doing this at an amateur level, that just sounds really fun uh, to get those guys in the room and to be able to do the, the long form conversation. Even if you do have to snip it into a TV format, 
I think that in and of itself, this, this ability to have these long form conversations, to have discussions, to hear people's points of view on both sides. I mean, nothing's really black and white. So everything's gray. So if you can get people in a room and have the discussion and then be able to put that into a uh, format or a medium that, you know, everybody can consume. So media, for example, or video, um, that's, I think, very critical. We live in this kind of headline culture where most people and we're all guilty of it. Right. Like, I think that there's. You know, I'll go ahead and read something about energy and I'll think this is a, a crazy. This article doesn't get it right at all. And then I'll go and I'll read something else about some other discipline and I'll just take it at face value. I'll read the headline and take it to face value. And then you catch yourself. And you said, well, wait a second. I just read in the same publication something about energy that I know was bogus. Then I'm taking something else over here at face value. And so we're kind of in this like headline culture. Right. And the more, you know, flamboyant or triggering or whatever the word you want to use of that headline the more emotion it gets out of the people, people are more likely to click. And that's kind of what's driving a lot of this. So just, you know, your ability to have the discussion and to <clears throat> talk about it and break it down you know, about the trade-offs and energy, um, I think is huge. And so I want to get into those things. I want to get into energy poverty kind of coming up here in a minute. But before we launch into some of those topics, which I know you're very well versed in, just from the perspective of people that may not know the history of the earth and, you know, I was it a uh, talk the other day and a geologist was mentioning that he'd gone back and looked at the different geological time scales. And he was kind of making an argument that when there was high CO2 and when we saw these rapid changes, it was kind of correlated with extinction events. I, you know, I have heard people say things like that in the past, but I've also heard from other geologists that look, the earth has been much, much warmer. You know, uh, the polar ice caps are actually something that we typically for, you know, many, many millions of years didn't even have just, just high level, uh, kind of history of the planet, just for people that don't really ever hear this. They just see the headline that it's the hottest year ever, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, and let me do that. Before I do, though, just mention a couple other names from the program. I mean, Ernie Moniz, former Secretary of Energy, and Dan Jurgen, Pulitzer Prize winner, oh, came yeah. on together, and we talked about the geopolitics of energy. And Julio Friedman, uh, who's at Columbia now, but was in the or the Obama administration and good friend and Stephen Humberg, chief scientist in the Environmental Defense Fund, were on together talking about hydrogen. Really deep, neat discussions. Um, we had Naomi Bonas from Stanford and, and Rachel wow. Fockery from the National Resources Defense Council talking about natural gas, the future of it. And again, fun, deep conversations. Michael Schellenberger was on with Arjun uh, Makajani talking about nuclear. And Michael is a committed environmentalist has written a wonderful book, Apocalypse yeah. Never, and, and, and now San Francisco. But And Arjun's a physicist, a nuclear, and it's interesting. Michael was arguing for nuclear and Arjun against it. <laughs> and and we had neat conversations about why that might be. So lots of others, but these are the kinds of things we're doing there. And I think it is so important to to get into classrooms with a civil dialogue that's deeper than what we're hearing in the headlines, as you just described, and let students and and all of us, we're all students, say, well, why is it that that these thoughtful people might not agree on everything? They agree on some things. And that's what's going to help, I believe, to drive away from the, the headlines. But, you know, look, if it bleeds, it leads. That's always been the case. Right. And, and what's bleeding now are people's emotions. But, you know, if you come into Earth history, yeah, the Earth is an old a ball of rock. It goes back 4.6 something billion years. And, and so we, we've we only been really understanding that deep history in not that long. We did, when I was in college, we were just understanding that the, that the plates were moving. <laughs> right. So we've, we've, we called it other things then, but it's become modern plate tectonics. Look, I don't think it was that long ago. I'm 60, in my 60s now. But anyway, so... But I think if you come back into more modern times, by geologically, I mean, in the last several million years, you see 50 cycles, plus or minus, when there were glaciers that moved down across North America into what's now Wisconsin and Michigan and New York, and then retreated uh, up to 50 times. So 70 or 80,000 years of glaciers deep into... <laughs> the latitudes and it, it by the way it's not real pretty when it's cold right you know you, you, you constrain the land on which we mammals and other life on earth can survive 
and then retreating. So these glacial interglacials have been happening for a long time. <clears throat> we're in one now. We're in an interglacial period. The ice has retreated. It started about 17, 18,000 years ago. And in the Gulf of Mexico, when, when things are frozen, sea levels are really low because all the oceans are locked up in ice on the poles. So the Gulf of Mexico was 300 feet lower than it is today. I mean, you can, you can picture what that might have looked like. And then as it starts to melt, and then, by the way, this is driven by processes we understand. It's the wobble and tilt of the Earth's axis and its orbit around the sun. You know, a, a physicist in prison kind of house arrest for 20 years figured that out by hand named Milankovitch. But anyway, so we understand these processes. And, and the sea level comes up quickly, about a centimeter a year. Now that's a lot, you know, an inch every couple of years as opposed to what it's doing now, which is a millimeter per year. And then we came into about, you know, eight, nine, ten thousand years ago, and you see the interglacial. The climate's pretty nice. Uh, sea level's rising slowly. It has been, uh, has been for nine, ten thousand years, and probably will continue to do that naturally. The question is, are we accelerating that rise today? And in fact, the data are quite interesting. Um, we right. haven't seen, there's one paper out there that says, but we haven't seen acceleration of the rate of sea level rise with our human effects yet. And you would think you would, as we accelerate the warming, why isn't sea level rising faster? And there are lots of reasons, but it's a neat piece of science, I think, that we're still trying to figure out, or people are trying to figure out. So the, the challenge is we've seen these glacial interglacials in the last five million years, about 50 of them every 100,000 years or so. That kind of dramatic change has been there. Um, we're pretty deep into this interglacial. They don't tend to last more than 15 to 20,000 years. So depending on how you count it, we could be due for another glacial period pretty soon. That will be dramatic. That's the kind of natural climate change that we would really, really have to adapt to. Now, as you come into the last hundred years with the human industrialization in part of the world, most of the world hasn't done that yet. They're just getting started, but we have. The United States, North America, Europe, mostly. Um, you do see you know, certainly the emissions of carbon dioxide from combusting fossil fuels. We've gone from in the 200s to over in the 400s parts per million now. That's a big percentage increase. And it's a greenhouse gas. There's no, there's no physical argument that CO2 and methane and other you know, water vapor are greenhouse gases. And the physics of trapping heat is very real. So we're warming a little bit as a result of that, about a degree, and could warm considerably more depending on how much higher that goes. There's not a CO2 temperature knob. I think some people think if you put CO2 right there, the temperature will always stay this way. It won't. And nobody, nobody in the climate world says it will. It, the models have quite a range of future temperatures in them. There's uncertainty, and that's the reality of modeling. But directionally, it's up. So that's the challenge, I think, today, is how do you lower those emissions and, and not take away the secure energy, by that I mean affordable, available, reliable energy that's needed to maintain modern economies and also to build emerging and developing economies. If you don't find options on the emissions reduction, and it's an emissions challenge, Max, it's not, it's not fuels. I, people want to focus on fuels. Let's get rid of all these things. Well, no. That's, first of all, that won't happen because economies are building on dense energy, period. Um, but we can focus on the emissions. How do you capture the emissions and do something with them? How do you uh, change some coal to natural gas or some other form of base load or dispatchable electricity to complement the intermittent energy of solar and wind? How do you do this in a way that works? Use hydrogen, et cetera. There are lots of options out there, geothermal for lowering emissions in our energy scheme. And if and as we focus on those emissions, I think the world is more likely to adapt those and adopt those both than, than they are if you say you've got to get rid of all your coal, all your oil, all your natural gas, which they're just not going to do. And, and that becomes then this policy conversation. How do you approach it? How do you incentivize it? How do you invest in it to encourage acceleration of emissions reductions, as well as keeping our land and our air and our water protected and always improving on those. It's complicated space. I mean, we could talk for 
days on this. We really could, and we would yeah. never repeat ourselves. It, it, you know, <laughs> there's just so much to think about, but that's when you hear these binary simple, <clears throat> well, climate change is the only problem. If you don't think that's the only problem, you're a denier. <laughs> well, right. no, not really. And if you don't think solar and wind are the only solution, you're a denier. Well, no, not really. Uh, climate is an issue. It's one of many. And solar and wind are part of a solution, but not the only part. And this is, this is the, the, the convergence of, of climate and energy, of the environment and energy that we have to get into. The more that think about it deeply, the more they come around, like Michael Schellenberger has and others, and right. say, wow, you know, it matters. Dense energy matters. So. Well, I think the reason why, because your point, you could talk on these, this subject uh, for hours and hours and not repeat a single topic. But the, the reason why I wanted you to go into kind of some of the geological stuff is that it's just so complex and the earth has been through these, you know, what I would call radical changes, uh, many, many times. And then we are now very focused on what are sh extremely short time periods, right? I mean, we're looking at 50 years, a hundred years, yeah. predicting. If you, look, if you years, stretch out your, years. stretch out your arms <laughs> at full length and that's earth history. Okay. Right. I'm going to take a fingernail file and I'm going to file my middle fingernail once. Zoop and shave off that much of my fingernail. If Earth history was linked, that, that filing is how long humans have been here. <laughs> right. Okay, now, right. I don't mean to get into religious discussions with folks. Uh, you can, beliefs and, and religion is what they are, but we can document, we can actually measure the age of the Earth with, with scientific processes of dating that we understand how old it is and how long things like humans have been around. Uh, the record is incomplete, but it's certainly got enough in it. So, look, uh, no, I was just talking five million years of these cycles. If you go back to the Mesozoic, when dinosaurs were thriving, you know, the, um, the, the, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous, which is Jurassic Park, it sits in the middle of that, 60 to a couple hundred million years ago, there was three to 6,000 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Right. Not 400. So, and, and CO2 is the food on which we all thrive. It is the food for growth. More CO2 in the atmosphere, things are bigger and greener. I mean, in the Cretaceous, plants were gigantic. So were animals. Large land roving things we call dinosaurs. There was a lot of food in the atmosphere, but they had, ad they had adapted to that climate. They had time. Lots of species went extinct, a lot thrived. Extinction events have been happening throughout geologic history and they will continue to do that. Some big ones have happened at the end of the big eras, the end of the Paleozoic was the biggest extinction at the end of the Permian and then you have the one at the end of the Mesozoic and others in between, etc. And they are partly extraterrestrial. These are big impact events typically like at Chicxulub when the big meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula, and we've got people at UT studying that, Sean Gullick and others tremendously, but they had, they had impacts that drove evolutionary change fast. You know, we couldn't stop it. Um, we may be able to stop those today, who knows, go out and blow up a, uh, an incoming meteor. But, yeah. but, you know, these are, it's very complex, the evolution of both animal and plant life and what has driven all those processes. It, there are people that make their whole lives studying just components of it, you know. Right. Uh, vertebrate and non-vertebrate paleontologists do that all the time. And it's fascinating science. So to th we're not unique in our, in our time frame here. There's been much hotter in the world's history, much, much, much hotter than it is today. No ice. And it's been much, much colder. Snowball Earth, there's been a couple documented times when the Earth was literally covered with ice. The right. whole Earth. Okay, now that's tricky, <laughs> and, and but those are processes that drove those that are fascinating and fairly complicated. So yes, I'm not trying to minimize the drama of today. We got to make sure that we don't raise the temperature two or three more degrees. That affects people right. negatively. Um, you could just got to put it in that geologic context and then see what we can do today to to to, to make sure that. We do well, absolutely. The best we can. absolutely. And I think that the point <clears throat> is the complexity and that's, uh, that's really something that I felt like you were, you know, uniquely 
position to speak to uh, because of your background. And so a couple other topics, I know we've got limited time, but I'd love to hit on energy poverty. And then I'd love to talk about um, the things that we're doing now to uh, to fight the climate stuff, but or the, the mainstream narratives you hear to fight the climate stuff and whether or not they'll be effective is kind of the last topic. But prior to then, just some of the things I've heard online, the speeches that you've given and the way that you talked about the world and energy poverty, been really powerful to me to hear it because you don't often hear some of the statistics. And so I think that's another contextual, uh, contextually important, you know, topic to discuss before sure. we talk about these uh, different solutions that are getting put forward. So yeah. just uh, let you go yeah. on that topic. Look, Harry Lynch is a filmmaker that I work with and have for a dozen years now and really smart guy, uh, very creative. And he's the brains behind all this. I'm just a pretty face. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 you know, we made this film called Switch way back and released it in 12 after a couple you know, years of filming and post-production. Then Harry went off and did some beautiful stuff on mental health and, and has a PBS series on called Now Hear This on Friday nights looking at um, music and com composition and composers through time. He goes and visits all the greats. But I got back with him half a dozen years ago and said, you know, Harry, we left out a big part of the world when we made the film Switch because Switch was looking at energy. We went to the best places in the world and looked at each of the forms of energy in their best light, but talked about the pros and cons. Very, very apolitical um, objective film. And people continue to say that. They said, there's no politics in this. You know, What's your perspective? And I said, my perspective is just looking at the pros and cons of things, which is what we do. So I said, hey, Harry, you know, we got to make another film and look at those without energy. We agreed to do that and went out and filmed in five different countries, which was filmed in 11 countries. We went to five different ones, Ethiopia, Kenya, Vietnam, Nepal, and Colombia. So hit each of the big continents. Looking at different circumstances where people are living without any energy or with limited energy. So emerging into the energy space now, literally off the grid, no grid at all. We brought first solar to the village of Gunchukwa in Colombia, the Arhuaco uh, tribe there, very powerful in switch on. We also went and looked at clean cooking in Nepal and visited Sana Kanchi and her family, but broader than that. And we, we went to Ethiopia uh, when we could. I don't even know we could travel there today, Max. So much has changed even in those few years with this, you know, this disruption there. But we visited the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is bringing electricity at a scale the Ethiopia they've never had before it could power half of their hundred million person economy and they're selling it around and and a lot of politics it, it's on the Blue Nile which flows north and merges into the Nile River into you know eventually into Cairo Egypt and Cairo got threatened by this damming of the river way upstream threatened to bomb it <laughs> so there's a lot of political conflict in northern Africa Saharan Africa around this because Egypt needs that water. These are things you don't think about. And we, we went uh, to Kenya and looked at one of the largest slums in Africa called Kibera outside of Nairobi and what they're doing. That, but the challenges of bringing electricity into that slum and the cartel that controls it in Kenya power and who illegal or, or stolen electricity and, and, and legal electricity and how you pay for that and killing people, etc. And, and then to Vietnam, who has emerged and is now competing with China to manufacture all of our stuff, <laughs> you know. So Vietnam used hydro. They dammed everything they could, a lot of topography, et cetera, but they only have so much, and it's a jungle, so they're not going to tear down their jungle and put up that much solar and wind, no matter what people say. So they've gone coal, and they've got good coal resources. They're going to build new coal power plants. 50 of them in the next 20 to 30 years. And I've had people tell me they'll never do that. Well, they're doing it. We went into the coal mine. We went into the power plants. We went to the moving it around offshore. So you're seeing this range of emergence in the world today. But here's some numbers that I think are important. Europe, Western Europe and the United States are only about 570 million people approaching 600. What is that? 7% of the world's population. Right. The other 93% don't live here, and they're just getting this energy economy going. So they're driving, and they're building just the way we did on coal and oil and natural gas, very affordable, reliable forms of energy. They're not going to stop that, regardless of what we try to do. 
now we can help them some. But when you think about six billion people on Earth that are just either none or starting to emerge and develop their economy, six billion people. And, and when we talk about poverty here, Max, in the most oppressed areas, it's not the kind we see. It's, it's poverty like you've never seen. You can't, the smell and the, and, and the sounds of poverty and, and the taste of poverty, uh, the sight of poverty, it's brutal. Um, you know, you, you're overwhelmed by it. Okay, uh, and so the thought that the world lives hungry and naked in the dirt in modern times when we take everything that we have for granted, and I'm not criticizing us, it's not a judgment term, we just wake up and expect the lights to come on every day right. when they don't, we're angry, big chill in Texas. Um, you know, there's this disparity still, and it doesn't have to exist. We have the capacity to power the world. And that is the prime job. Poverty is the major driver of, of disruption in the world today. It's, if, you, if you go look at diversity, equity, inclusion issues, if you look at transracial issues, everything comes back in many ways to economic poverty. If you address and solve that, it begins to solve all sorts of other issues along with it, educational issues, access, jobs, um, pride. And so women are, women are differentially impacted by energy poverty. They go for the water. They're cooking indoors with wood, which kills 3 million people every year. Just the smoke, that's how many were killed in COVID in 2020, and we shut down the world's economy. Every year, three million people from breathing smoke, cooking in their homes with biomass and dung and wood. Uh, refrigeration for vaccines and medicines. Um, immigration and migration away from, away from you know, autocracies towards hope. It, you start to change that whole scheme, addressing the environmental impacts of energy, addressing climate, mitigation and adaptation both. It all takes energy. And you can't, it's a paradox, energy won't end poverty, but you can't get out of this poverty without energy. And until we make the primary focus of our efforts from poverty to prosperity, none of this stuff will change, including climate. It just, from poverty to prosperity, if we will dive into that for real and take those trillions of dollars and not give them away, but invest in countries and local economies so that they can do the build the kinds of micro markets and markets that fit their culture to lift themselves from poverty that will have an impact on the world like nothing we've ever seen and and it is but it could be accelerated so I'm, i i think we have to understand that we don't represent the world <laughs> you know yeah in vast majority there are just so many people now, and 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 birth rates, uh, fertility rates again are tightly correlated to education. The higher the education, the lower the rates of fertility. You right. see that in in the U.S. and Europe and other modern economies. You know we're negative. We wouldn't actually be growing in the U.S. if we weren't bringing people in through immigration, and and so. That's where we came out on that film and and starting to pull all this energy in and the economy together with the environment. It's, it's a powerful piece and, and we have to, I think it's, it's vital that our, at all levels we understand this. And when, we, when you start to understand it, it changes the dialogue. We start to have really powerful common dialogues around how to address that and climate. So I think India, India said clearly in COP26, yeah, send us 1.1 trillion bucks and we'll start to deal with it. But otherwise we're gonna, continue to evolve our economy with the energy we have, just like China has, and, and that they're going to do that. Um, so you start to have a different conversation with India and, and Modi and, 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 and Xi in China if, if you really start thinking about emissions, not fuels, about the broad environment, about the economy and how we all play in that. It could be very aggregating, very powerful. It could collect us all in the world on some common, a common goal and wouldn't that be nice? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that understanding the energy poverty side of the story, so <clears throat> kind of leading the conversation, it's like you got to understand that this is a complex problem we're facing, which you talked about at the beginning. Then you talked about the impacts of the lack of energy on you know the majority of the people on the planet. And so it's a very kind of, I mean, I hate using this word, but it's like kind of like a privileged stance that we have here in the Western world that we can just, uh, you know, look at all these other places and say, you know, look, these are the things that helped us get the advantage in the world, you know, using fossil fuels primarily to lift us out of the poverty. And if you look, you talked about all the different things that uh, people are impacted by it. And you can see it in the, in the data, right? You can see that as we've used more energy, as we've had more access to energy, you know, human life has gotten better. Yet I feel like we're kind of, as the Western world, getting together and grandstanding at these, uh, these conferences. And it's sort of like this kind of like let them eat cake type of uh, moment, right? Maybe that's too dramatic, but it feels like that, right? You see all these leaders and they're just kind of like uh, saying that the rest of the world can kind of, uh, you know, be put under these, the mandates that us in the West well, they're, decide. They're, Go ahead. they're couching it. They're couching it in climate saying we have to address climate so we don't hurt these poor people. We right. can't let the temperature raise one or two or three degrees. And it will differentially impact those in the you know, the equatorial regions, you're going to add another 10% of heat. Well, they don't have air conditioning now. Right. And they don't have any modern forms of energy. So yes, it will hurt. But to couch climate in that we're going to help them, we have to do this, spend $125 trillion, according to the latest IEA report. Um, well, yes, but the other thing that would help <laughs> is, is lifting the economy up through investments in economic growth so that they can have the same kinds of things we do. I mean, privileged is a nice word. It's entitled. You know, right. we, 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 we are so naive to the realities in the world, we, we don't even know how entitled we're behaving when it comes to these conversations. And it's wrong. It's yeah. just morally wrong not to understand this and what it, what it, the opportunity space in front of us, which is very real, the solvability of it, <laughs> you know, and then, and then what we need to do to move forward to begin to invest in that, and how powerful it be for all of us. It'll help. It'll help all of us. Now look, look. Seventy-five percent of the world today live in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So, uh, three out of every four people. One out of every three live in India and China alone. Right. One third of the world's population in two countries. Now, 75% of the world, when you look at a map of the world's global income, there are, to be sure, there are very wealthy people in spots in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Very wealthy. But the vast majority of that lives, of those people live on less than $12,000 a year. A thousand bucks a month for a family. Much of it Less than that, <laughs> okay, like $3 a day. When you have that level of poverty spread across these vast regions of, of geographic expanse and population, this is the challenge before us. And now the first, the first electron of electricity that they get, they get a cell phone, charge it up, and they know what's going on in the world. It's no longer a lack of knowledge about what's happening in the world. Everybody knows they can see it. And, and therefore we have, we are, we have a recognition that's going on globally today about where we could all be. <clears throat> and that doesn't intimidate me. It shouldn't intimidate any of us. We, we should welcome invest in and rejoice this possibility that we could lift the whole world from poverty access for all. And that would literally change our environment. And let me say that again. It would change our environment. Why? Because the cleanest environments in the world are where it's rich. Right. Go look at air quality maps of the world. The cleanest where it's rich. Water quality. I don't drink the water when I'm, when I'm in other countries out of the tap. <clears throat> no way. Because it's not cleaned up like it is here. <clears throat> Go look at soil quality. It, it just Now, CO2 emissions are higher where it's rich because we consume some, so much more energy per capita, they're higher, starting to come down. We've got to address that. But wealthy, the wealthy world will be able to address that. The poor world won't. They can't address that. They, 
they're just starting to get coal. <laughs> you know? right. So this is this is uh, <clears throat> this is the reality that we're going to see is both the economic multiplier and the the population multiplier. You when you multiply those together, the demand for energy has the potential to continue to accelerate greatly. And we've got to be able to serve that. The resources are there, but we have to be able to serve it with infrastructure investment and, and the kinds of, of legal and political systems that make sure that it's clean, you know, that it's done well. By clean, I mean all four pillars of the environment, not just one. Yeah, and you have to, <clears throat> so and I know we're getting a little short on time, but you know, when you think about these problems, Again, I love that you mentioned earlier, maybe it was on one of the other talks I heard about, but about these definitions of clean, green, all these things, every, every form of energy has an impact. And then we look at what we've done. And so you have to kind of think about that, which we talked about earlier. And then you look at these countries, like you mentioned, where the population centers are and where you look at uh, the types of energy that they're using. And, you know, one thing we've done here is we've uh, not only, uh, you know, we're criticizing other areas, but we've also outsourced a lot of our emissions to places like China because, you know, we don't make anything here anymore. Right. And so when we think about this problem, you hear the West focusing a lot on ourselves and then primarily like in the oil and gas industry. It's like if we just stop big, bad, you know, small producer in the Permian from emitting a little extra methane on his lease, that that will somehow fix the world. But the reality is, is that we've outsourced the majority of our uh, emissions to countries like China and then now they're not going to participate in these big grandstand kind of climate meetings that we're having. And so as you think about it, kind of the follow up the last topic, as we think about, you know, policies or actions that could actually make a difference, uh, you know, what do we really have? Because I think a lot of the things that I hear, especially as someone who tries to be, uh, you know, have the podcast and talk to different people across different areas of energy. I just don't see a lot of the things that are getting pushed forward that are going to actually make much, if any, of an impact. So just your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I show a figure in some of my talks that I like a lot. Um, it kind of shows the world's emissions across the bottom, 35, 36, 37 gigatons, somewhere in there for CO2, not methane. And then we look at the kind of a ratio of consuming and producing. So the OECD, the Organization of Economic and Deve Developed Nations, is... Um, the rich the club of rich nations consumes a lot more stuff than we produce okay and then the non oecd china and the others produce more than they consume now they make a lot of co2 emissions in doing that because they use a lot of coal to do it and other fossil fuels and other things too so what's happened is that they're manufacturing everything china manufactures 25 percent of the world's stuff alone today and asia broadly almost 50 and it's growing. So by sending stuff to the developed world, you're essentially saying, yeah, you emit our CO2. And and that <laughs> there's only one atmosphere. Right. So it doesn't solve for climate when you have when you buy an offset from somebody else that's making your stuff, whether you're a state or a company or or a country. This offsets game is a little disingenuous in many ways. You actually have to lower the emissions of molecules into the atmosphere or remove them from the atmosphere, direct air capture and other are growing things, plants to remove it. So to go to net zero emissions, it's really the production and the, re and the reduction, and it's the net. Now look, let's talk about another form of energy, calories. I, I try to maintain my weight. So if as long as I'm burning as many calories each day as I'm ingesting, I will stay at this current weight that is net zero <laughs> calories yeah. in my body. If I want right. to lose weight, which we're talking about doing, I actually have to, you know, burn more than I ingest. So let's do it in emissions terms. I actually have to take more out on that side than I put into the atmosphere. But make no mistake, there's still some going to go into the atmosphere. It's not that they're going to go away. You just have to figure out things to offset them. And that's not easy. The same folks often who are against emitting are also against capturing CO2 and putting it under the ground, carbon capture and storage or utilization and storage, against direct air capture, you know, against a lot of the big levers that we can use to make net zero happen. There aren't that many levers, Max. Yeah. In the time frame needed, and by that I mean for climate, 
If we're going to address climate in the time frame that the climate modelers say is needed, decades, at the scale that's needed, gigatons, there's only a few things that work. Efficiency, doing less right. with more. We ended our first film that way. Some would argue that the rebound effect causes that not to be effective at all. I disagree some. I think we can do more with less. I might have said less with more. <laughs> we can do more yeah. using less energy. That's efficiency. Uh, nuclear. Nuclear has no emissions. It's very large scale. It's very dense. You know, China is building the most reactors in the world by far today. I hope India follows them. We'll see. I hope that the U.S. gets back on some nuclear programs as well. It, it would be great for our emissions reductions. Small modular reactors. No, you don't have to have gigawatt size. You can go to smaller ones. New scale and other companies, 50, 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt. That's a big wedge. Um, carbon capture and storage is a big wedge. So capturing it out of the emissions pipe from a power plant or a refinery or a chem, you know, a, a cement factory or a hydrogen factory, all sorts of ways we make CO2 emissions, not just power today, a battery manufacturing plant, you know, um, yeah. capturing those emissions and doing something with them, putting them back into the earth from where they came, storing them for a long time. It's doable. With the, the physics works. We've been working on it 20 years in my day job at the Bureau. The physics works. It's expensive. It's getting cheaper. We're trying to figure out the whole cost cycle there, what that looks like, what the cash flows look like along that whole capture and compress it to supercritical and move it and inject it and store it. There's a lot that goes on there. Hydrogen is another one. Using hydrogen as a fuel. Hydrogen burns. Um, most people may not know that, but think of the Hindenburg. It was a hydrogen dirigible or blimp. It went up in flames and it also can be used as an energy carrier. So a fuel cell, hydrogen in fuel cells carries electricity or electric, you know, the carrier for it. So it's almost like a battery with no CO2 emissions out of the tailpipe. The nice part is hydrogen is denser than batteries are. So you can get more bang for your buck with a fuel cell than a battery, which weighs a lot. It's not as dense as gasoline, <laughs> you know, for per weight, you get more bang for your buck with gasoline and jet fuel and diesel than anything else. Um, Hydrogen's a big one. You got to store it though, and it has a lot in that chain as well. Uh, keep going. Geothermal could be part of the solution where we have that resource, but it is a resource. Uh, solar and wind, you know, using capturing the the light and, partic and uh, particularly, but even the heat of the sun in some unique places, and the, and the wind, the motion of the wind. Now, those two, like hydro, building big dams, is very powerful where you have the topography and the rainfall, or you can pump water up a hill. <laughs> it's called, you know, pumped hydro. It, we pump water up a hill and we have extra energy from something and then flow it down later. The energy equation isn't very good, but if you have extra, do some good work with it instead of wasting right. it. So these are the big things. There are not that many of them that can scale in the time frames that are needed. And we need to do all of them. We need to recognize that different things that I just described are going to work in different parts of the world. I can't tell Germany to go heavy duty solar. They're trying, but they have the solar intensity of Seattle, Washington. Right. <laughs> you know, it's cloudy it's, there and yep. it's kind of higher latitude. Same with Russia, low lat you know, the latitudes are, you know, they're, it's a low angle of sun and it's cloudy and the days are short and blah, blah, blah. So, you, you, you know, you gotta, you got to recognize that different parts of the world are going to use these resources that they have in ways that they can. And we should invest and incentivize them to do that, not penalizing fuels, looking at emissions reductions, and incentivizing and investing in those that succeed in reducing their emissions while providing affordable, reliable energy to lift the world from poverty. That's a simple statement. It's the dual challenge. It's solvable. And we, you know, it's going to all start with education. Thanks for what you're doing because everybody hears things and things that they don't, <clears throat> you know, they, ha they don't know. They haven't thought about before. And that moves the ball a little further along. Well, I think it's great. And everything you're saying is, uh, is exactly the type of narrative that we need to hear for people that people need to hear. You know, my biggest frustration has been the, 
different things I'm seeing getting pushed forward from whether it be a policy standpoint or whether you hear about popular narratives. Even in the capital side, you know, as somebody who has had companies that invest in energy infrastructure, primarily in uh, midstream or pipeline infrastructure, you know, the, the capital for those markets is very hard to get now. And you see more capital flooding into kind of the green space. But then you look at a lot of the initiatives and things that we're seeing that capital providers want to fund. We're looking at what policymakers are doing. And I don't know that they are getting us realistically to get to those goals. And so I think that having somebody like you articulate kind of what the actual things are that we should focus on, maybe someone can hear this and realize that, uh, you know, investing another billion dollars into electric charging stations for, you know, EVs, which by the way, 96% of people charge those at their house anyways, maybe that's not the best use of that billion dollars or whatever it may be. Maybe we can actually focus on some things uh, take, that will push forward. Yeah, things that take more difference. than that, <clears throat> you know, it, to really truly, it, it's interesting, where should federal money be used? You know, should it subsidize gas stations? Should it subsidize CNG stations? Should it subsidize fuel cells? Should it subsidize EVs? I don't know, but every time the government tries to pick winners, right? like telling you, you have to eat, let's go back to my food analogy. You have to eat a certain kind of food only for your diet. Well, I'd like to mix my food up a little bit. Maybe I have some beliefs that don't allow me to eat meat, you know, and I want to go with, with things that are grown or vice versa. Uh, maybe I have reactions to fruits. <laughs> I mean, right. you can't tell people what to eat as they balance out their energy and, and their personal energy. And, Every time the government tries to pick winners, <laughs> however well-intended it is, it fails miserably. Right. You know, it, because the markets do that. The, the markets, and it, it's going to vary. City, EVs might work in cities. Um, I wouldn't mandate them, but they certainly, I can plug in my small EV and drive three miles to work. There's no noise. There's no emission. Perfect. Um, but I'm not going to try to hop in an electric vehicle and drive to Houston from Austin tomorrow you know, there's one charging station I know about, but even if there were multiple, it's a, it's a different kind of energy intensity problem. And we need denser energy for that. So a fuel cell might make sense or a combustion engine. We can get a lot more efficient there. We could get way more than 20 miles to the gallon and get 40. That changes the world. And there's, there's a lot of mining trade-offs, mine materials for vehicles that you can do a lot better with dense energy. Look, the reality in cars is the gasoline, the, the, mo the engine itself is very inefficient. You know, there's a lot of moving parts and, and a lot of useful work is done just making that engine <coughs> work. A motor, an electric motor is very efficient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I have them in my Cuisinart, you know, in a, in a blender, <coughs> etc. So, but the fuels, Batteries are very inefficient and gasoline is very efficient. So a very efficient fuel gasoline with an inefficient engine and a very inefficient fuel batteries with an efficient motor. There's trade-offs and, and th that, that reality plays out as we start to look at transportation challenges. But that's just a little piece of the emissions problem, transportation. It's very, it's an expensive one. We can go after bigger things. In fact, the biggest thing we could do right now is just replace coal with natural gas for power gen and other things. We did it in the U.S. for the most part. It's happening. And our emissions have come down seven, eight hundred million tons a year just with that replacement of coal with gas plus renewable portfolio standards for the most part in states. So the growth of wind mostly, some solar now, but a big wedge of gas replacing coal has brought our emissions down tremendously. If Asia were to do that, I did the calculations myself. If Asia were to replace coal with gas like we've done, we'd take 3 billion tons of emissions out of the atmosphere every year. 3 billion tons. Right. This is, this is a huge wedge, just a simple replacement, not even with capturing the emissions from that natural gas. So we've got to allow some of these things to happen and not protest everything. You can't not like everything. <laughs> Right. I mean, you can, I, but I it's saw not him like get us anywhere. I saw him like even maybe Sierra Club or someone came out protesting like a carbon capture pipeline project recently. So it just yeah. seems like anything at all that perpetuates any type of fossil fuels, uh, there's negative, you know, pushback towards it. We're not going to solve 
all those problems. But no, you're right. I mean, I think that there are some quick win things to do. I, yeah. I always try to preference it that I'm talking my book. I work in natural gas. I'm a big proponent of it. I think that it could do a lot of amazing things. And by the way, almost everything's made out of it. So we're going to need it regardless, um, or right. at least the byproducts and the petrochemicals. So uh, yeah, but molecules, I, but I wanna, yeah, molecules and electrons. You need them both. You can't do everything with electrons and everything with molecules. I work a lot with private equity groups, big ones, and some venture capitalists. And yeah, there's a lot of money that's been flooding to green, whatever green means. Again, we got to define it. Right. Um, if it's just carbon and has an impact on the land and the water or the air, then it's not green to me. <clears throat> there are some right. things that are trade-offs there, but... It was easier to do that because for a while, the oil and gas companies weren't making much money. Yeah, Shale was yeah. an expensive venture. took a while to crack that technology <clears throat> nut, close to a decade. And so there was a lot of capital being destroyed. So I don't want to put money into something that's losing money and I can virtue signal green and get a double win. Right. But now that the companies are making money again, and you, you know, there's no shock when you put tension into the supply, which our policies are doing today in Europe and the U.S. Don't blame anybody else. Just look at your own policies. You're putting tension into supply. Demand is growing after COVID as we knew it would. Price is going up. You know, don't blame anybody else. It's our own policies. Now, it's complicated. You know, if you didn't expect demand to go up after COVID, well, you weren't watching the data. Look at the Great Recession of 09. It went right back up. If you didn't think that the wind would stop blowing in Europe sometimes. Well, you don't look at nature data. It's clear it'll stop blowing. The sun stops shining too, so you have to have other things. So these drive price up and companies are making money again. You're gonna to start to see, you're already starting to see quietly, private equity coming back into the smart oil and gas. Right, right. <laughs> They're using terms to kind of provide some cover. <laughs> you know, yeah, we're investing yeah. in intelligent oil and gas. Okay, good, uh, right. whatever you wanna call it. It's making money again, and and that's important. Now, let's clean it up. Let's clean it all up. Coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear. Hydro has damage. Solar and wind have big damage to the environment. You know, bio biofuels is hugely impactful right. to the environment. I mean, are you kidding? That's you know, a head scratcher. Why well, we see that one being brought up or thrown into renewables type uh, it, discussions. It, just because you can grow it doesn't it is renewable, but it isn't clean. Right. You know, you, to get it from the plant to the plant, from growing the plant to burning it in the plant, there's so much that goes on. Yeah. And, and it's all emitting CO2. So, so right. you know, I think, again, this is where the education comes in so much, Max, is we've got to continue to speak uh, as candidly as we can. We've got to be as, um, I, use, I testified at U.S. Senator this year, in their first climate hearing and, and try to differentiate between completely factual statements and factually complete. Yeah. So I can say something that's completely factual, but if it doesn't have a lot of other completely factual things, it's not factually complete. And so I can mislead with that kind of data, if you will. So we've got to be as com factually complete as we can across the space. It's really hard to do it. Nobody knows everything. So I'm always learning too and adding more facts and data. But as we get there, we'll start to understand these systems and how all these systems interplay and can work together to do to address the dual challenge. And, and I think there are a lot of thoughtful people out there that are hungry to be part of a solution and not just protesting anymore. You know, they want right. to be part of something that's driving towards solutions and real solutions. As they get into the details, they start to realize that picking a single winner in energy doesn't address it doesn't solve it. Um, it's just a piece. And it's an important one, but it's just a piece. And that CO2, although really important, isn't the only environmental issue. So this is the this is the more complex narrative that I think people are they're getting in there. They're, they're starting to go. I hear a lot of like you say, I've been doing this a long time and hearing lots of different folks talking about it now. It's awesome. You know, Amazing yeah. how much you work and get done if you don't care who gets the credit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's great. Let's just do it. You know? No, you're doing, I mean, you're doing great things. And you mentioned a few people uh, like Michael Schellenberger. You know, he's, uh, I, like, I really liked his book and uh, he's gotten popular. There's some others that now have got kind of gotten a little bit more popular. Uh, and, and that's where my dad brought you up. And I'll kind of end it with this is that, 
He's like, well, you know, uh, he's like, Dr. T- Scott Tinker, he's out here. He's been saying these things for a long time. He's like, you need to look at his stuff. And so I think there are people that have followed your career and you've clearly made an impact. And uh, hopefully we can record this piece of media and put it out to some people and make and make more of an impact. But uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time and, and me just kind of reaching out cold calling you agreeing to do this. Uh, it means a lot. You bet, Max. Yeah, and keep up the good work. Keep your chin up. It's, I know sometimes it's hard, you know, the... You, but you got you got get thick skin and <laughs> you just do the best you can and and recognize uh, how you're learning too and we're all learning and that's part of it and so uh, keep it up happy to be with you today all right we'll try to try to do the best mm-hmm. thanks Scott you bet.